Good morning. Keep practicing, Benita. You'll get it figured out. <laughs> that or you're just going to play the keys right off that piano. I don't know. Good morning and uh, welcome to you. A very special welcome to you if you happen to be a visitor with us today. If you are a visitor, we'd be delighted if we could welcome you more formally if you'd be willing to stand up and introduce yourself. Now, we never require that, more of a request, but do we have any first-time visitors with us this morning? All right, with that then um, behind us, those of you sitting in the pews closest to the Burgundy worship folders, uh, if you would please take those out at this time, you can put your information in there. If you have a prayer need, go ahead and fill out one of the prayer request slips. Um, hang on to it, and as you leave worship this morning, by the front doors is the box on a pedestal that has praying hands on it. You can place your prayer requests inside that box, and uh, they'll be gathered by our prayer ministers and prayed over throughout the week. And uh, if you would like some private prayer time with one of our prayer ministers, then just gather here at the altar rail closest to the pulpit at the conclusion of today's worship service. Someone will be glad to meet you there and to pray with you. Uh, we do want to remember in our prayers uh, those known to have been hospitalized, in particular uh, Cam Smith and Art Harker. I would invite you at this time to join me in a moment of silence in honor uh, and in remembrance of uh, Senator John McCain, um, a great American hero and public servant. So if you would, just a moment of silence. Amen. Um, in your bulletin today, uh, I'm going to lift up at the bottom of page two, uh, Connections Adult Education Hour registration available after worship today. There's information in your bulletin on uh, the various classes that are being offered, so keep that in mind. On page 11, just want to point out that uh, Rally Day is coming up uh, Sunday, September 9th. Um, we're going to have food and fun and fellowship and uh, it's going to be a tailgate lunch thing. So um, that's all going to be following the 10.30 a.m. services. So you could come to this worship, go out for breakfast, come back for lunch. <laughs> anyway, I wanted you to be aware of that. Altar Flowers today by uh, Renee Grogin in memory of husband Tim. Lorraine Martin in memory of husband Don. Uh, Denny and Cheryl Larson in honor of their 48th anniversary. Are they at this service? Second service? Uh, Phil and Carolyn Ellsworth. Are you with us this morning at this service? Um, and, and so they're both celebrating anniversaries. So we thank them for that. And uh, David, you've got a few words to share. I am so glad Benita is here. He's picking on me a lot less now that you're here. <laughs> Jack has fresh material. Good morning. <laughs> this summer, we once again hosted our uh, annual Music Start program. Music Start uh, is a music camp that we run here at ALC for four weeks of the month of June. This year, we had 16 students enrolled in a variety of instruments from flute, French horn, violins, saxophones. Um, this morning, we're going to have three young people. Uh, Rich is still trying to learn to play that trumpet over there. <laughs> He's playing field flugelhorn. But three, three of our, our students, or two of our students and one instructor, in an arrangement that they worked up this summer at Music Start, just as a thank you uh, for your support, but also to, to show what these kids learn over the kids, young adults learn over the, uh, the course of that program. And Megan has played two years, Ryan one half a year on cornet and half a year on horn. Reagan, uh, Megan's played two years on flute, Ryan's done a half a year on cornet and half a year on horn and this morning he's playing the horn.
I invite you to stand as you are able. We gather this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God full of compassion and mercy, abounding in steadfast love. Amen. Trusting in God's promise of forgive us, forgiveness, let us now confess our sin against God and one another. Eternal God, our Creator. In you we live and move and have our being. Look upon us, your children, the work of your hands. Forgive us all our offenses and cleanse us from proud thought and empty desires. By your grace, draw us near to you, our refuge and our strength. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. In the mercy of Almighty God, Christ died for us while we still were sinners. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. Our opening hymn is in uh, the LBW, the Green Hymnals, number 546, Selected Verses. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth.
us pray together. Holy God, your word feeds your people with life that is eternal. Direct our choices and preserve us in your truth, that renouncing what is false and evil, we may live in you through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare boldly as I ought to speak the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. On this 14th Sunday after Pentecost, the Holy Gospel is from St. John, the sixth chapter. Now Jesus said, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. And when many of his disciples heard it, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, he said to them, Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And Jesus said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. 
Now after this, many of Jesus' disciples turned back, and they no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered Jesus, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and we have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. The Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Uh, there was a term uh, that was once frequently used um, within the Christian faith, but this particular terminology is rarely used today. However, even with the infrequent use of this particular term in more contemporary Christian circles, I believe the concept is not completely foreign to us. And the term I speak of is the title of my sermon today, backsliding. Now, this term backslide first became popular back in the 1600s which means that, like a lot of you, it's been around a while, um, but probably longer than most of you. So, the first recorded use of the term backslide is by way of a man named uh, John Bunyan. Now, he's not to be confused with his brother Paul <laughs> Bunyan. The Paul was a lumberjack but John, John Bunyan was a Puritan preacher, an English Puritan preacher, lived in the 1600s. He's most famous for a book that he wrote titled uh, Pilgrim's Progress, and it was written in 1678. Now, in this story, Pilgrim's Progress, there are several characters with very interesting names. Um, Two of the characters, well, one of the characters' names is Christian. The other character's name is Hopeful. That's their names. And they are on a religious pilgrimage. And while they are on this pilgrimage and journeying down the road, um, Christian and Hopeful get in a conversation with one another, and they start talking about another character in the book by the name of temporary. So here you have Christian, hopeful, talking about, gossiping about, whatever, this other character, temporary. And the, the gist of the conversation is, is that this temporary character had begun the pilgrimage with the other two, uh, but along the way, temporary had fell by the wayside. Or as John Bunyan would word it, temporary backslid. He backslid. And from that time and from that notation uh, so long ago, that's where we get this term backslide. Um, and, and it's a term that simply refers to people who were once very faithful uh, in their walk of faith, but they eventually, for a variety of reasons, whatever, lose interest in their Christian um, pilgrimage, their Christian walk of faith. Now, we go to today's scripture reading from the sixth chapter of John's Gospel. Um, clearly, we've been here for a few weeks now. We know that uh, Jesus is finishing one of his more obscure teachings. Um, by obscure, I, I use the definition, something that is shrouded or hidden something that is not easily understood, something that is mysterious. So what Jesus is talking about and teaching about is obscure because Jesus says several things which confused many of his listeners and, and really upset some and even offended, greatly offended others. And included in that is this comment, very truly I tell you, 
unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and unless you drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now we have to imagine ourselves in the situation of the people that day there in the synagogue in Capernaum who are uh, listening to what Jesus has to say. Um, maybe you could imagine yourself uh, at a, a, let's say a revival meeting or something like that on some hillside outside of Prescott and there's some famous preacher or something that, that, that comes and, and that preacher declares to you Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you are as good as dead. And you need to ask yourself, how would you respond to that if you heard somebody say those words? Because there is a fine line between obscure and crazy, right? If you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you'll live forever. If you don't eat my flesh, you don't drink my blood, you are as good as dead. So that's the situation that many of these people find in. And as, as a result of this obscure statement or teaching, we are told um, that many of Jesus' disciples, not the original 12 group, but many of those others who were following along, they turned back. They quit following Jesus. In essence, they became that character from Pilgrim's Progress, that character named Temporary. Now, there, there probably was no single reason um, that can be identified as to why so many uh, stopped following Jesus at this time. It was probably a combination of things. Maybe this obscure statement of Jesus about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, maybe that was just the straw that broke the camel's back. We don't know for sure. But what we do know is, is that a large number of disciples, probably more left at that time, more backslid at that time, than stayed and remained faithful. So, um, so much for evangelism, Jesus. But what I would suggest uh, to you is this, that backsliding, even though we don't use the term a lot anymore, it, it is definitely a reality in the church. It, it's an all too common occurrence within the Christian experience, and, and many of you know that. Now, the Bible is filled with people who start out well, but who end up backsliding. Um, for the sake of brevity, I'm going to offer to you today one example that many of you are probably not familiar with. In the New Testament, there is a Christian named Demas. D-E-M-A-S. Demas is his name. Demas is mentioned only three times in the New Testament scriptures. The first time that he is mentioned is in the Apostle Paul's letter to Philemon. And Paul introduces Demas in that letter saying, Demas and Luke, my fellow workers. Well, we know who Luke is. Right? He's the author of the Gospel of Luke. He's, he's um, you know, a, a beloved physician. Um, he's going to be quite an important character in the life of the New Testament. But here we have Demas and Luke named together. And in fact, actually Demas is given the honor here of being named before Luke. So he's in high regard. High regard. Now the second time that Demas is mentioned is in the Apostle Paul's letter to the Colossians. And this is what Paul writes there. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas. So it seems something has happened here. I'm, you know, it's not just the change of order from Demas and Luke to Luke and Demas, but we have Luke being um, exemplified or, 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 you know, they use the term, Jesus uses, the, or Paul uses the term with him, beloved. But there, there's no such mention of any characteristic of Demas. So, you know, I, I don't, you know, you wonder, you don't want to read too much into this. You know, maybe that's just the way Paul was writing. But later then, Paul 
um, directs our attention to Demas one more time. And this time it's in the second letter to his friend Timothy, where Paul writes this, Demas deserted me. Demas deserted me, having loved this present age. So here is this character. We don't know a lot about him, but we know he begins out, out strong. He's even mentioned before Luke. Then he seems to be sort of slipping a little bit there in, in the eyes of Paul. And the next thing we know, he's gone. He just flat deserted Jesus. And it's interesting, you know, other, Paul has other issues with other people from time to time. Mark, John Mark being one of them, right? But the thing about John Mark is he, he gets in a fallout with Paul, but he ends up, you know, connected to Peter and, and writing the Gospel of Mark. And by the way, the Gospel of Mark is really Peter's Gospel. Mark is the one who penned it. It's called the Gospel of Mark, but he became an associate of Peter's after he had a falling out with Paul. So he's still in the story, even though he has a falling out with Paul. But this is the last time we will ever hear any reference to the name Demas. Something happened here, and, and he is off the radar completely. Some would say he backslid. Backsliding is not merely a problem for biblical characters like Demas and others. It's an issue in the modern church, and we know that. I remember when I first came here, and as I do uh, in any church I go to, I can't remember who the individual was. They'll probably remind me after worship today or at the, at the next service. But I sit down with somebody who's been around a while. Um, and, and there's a lot of people here who've been around a while, and I take out the picture directory, and we start going through the picture directory, and I ask about different people. What's going on in their lives? Are they facing certain challenges? Are these uh, leadership potential people? Are they have served the church in various ways. Tell me more about these people. And we were going through the picture directory, and time and time again, we would come across an individual, and, and my host would say something about, well, you know, this person used to be very involved in, in the church, but they haven't been around for a long time. Or they're now no longer a member. Or they'd say something about, well, this, used, this person used to be really active, but I don't think they're even here anymore. And, and we know that, you know, some people pass away and that sort of thing. We know other people just decide they're going to move on. Um, they go to a different church, they, they try another uh, flavor or whatever, you know, you're not all things to all people. Um, that's not the people I'm talking about. I'm talking about the people who were once active in the life of the congregation, but they, they fall by the wayside, but they, they don't tie up with another congregation. They just, they just quit worshiping, and, and you know some of these people, right? Um, I, I've seen it time and again with parents that were very involved when their children were in Sunday school and then as their children go through confirmation once their children are confirmed not only do their children drop off the face of the earth but oftentimes the parents will too and it usually doesn't happen suddenly sometimes it does usually they just start pulling back more and more and more and they're doing different things and again I'm not talking about people who go to a different church I'm talking about people who just you know step away from their their walk of faith and I want to just simply pose an important question why do people backslide I'm not asking why they would leave and go to a different church. I mean, why do people backslide? Why do people just, who are once faithful followers of Jesus Christ, just sort of park it and, and go off radar? And I suppose there are a lot of different reasons why, and it's complicated. Um, you know, some people get offended by the pastor or offended by something else that's going on in the church or whatever. I, I've, you know, I've experienced a lot of that. But... Much of the time, not all the time, but much of the time, um, people backslide because they lack spiritual maturity. Um, remember when Jesus fed the 5,000 uh, by the Sea of Galilee? 
And the crowd followed him to the other side of the sea. And Jesus read their hearts. And Jesus said of these people, he said, You seek me not because you saw a miracle, but you seek me because you ate of the loaves and had your fill. In other words, the only reason you're here, I know why you're here. You're not here because you want to hear more about the message or know about me, more about me. You're here because you want another free lunch. You know, and, and, and that's, you know, that's not a sign of deep spiritual maturity. Um, because basically, what, that per, what, what Jesus is saying is, is that some people who followed him were there simply for what they could get out of it. What's in it for me? Now, I understand that most of us started out at that place, right? What's in it for me? That's not a bad place to start out your Christian walk of faith. I was dying of alcoholism and drug addiction. And um, I was searching for a savior, right? And Jesus became my savior. And wow, what's in it for me? You know, just life and a future and salvation. That's all, that's all good. I mean, most people start out with what's in it for me. The problem is, is that as we grow and mature as disciples, we're supposed to move out of what's in it for me and get to the place where, you know, what's God calling me to do for his glory? But there, some people just never seem to be able to plant deep enough spiritual roots to get to that particular place. Um, I think they're the, the people that, you know, the, the parable of the soils, where some of the seed falls on good soil and some falls on rocky soil and some falls on the thorns and all that. Well, I think what, this is what Jesus was talking about when the seed that fell on rocky soil, it sprouts up, but it never establishes deep roots. So then when the scorching sun comes, then when the challenges come and all those things, you know, when the devil starts messing with them and all that stuff, they just don't have deep enough roots to make it. And my point is this, is how quick we are so often in our walk of faith to discard the words of Jesus or to ignore the words of Jesus when he said, if any want to be my follower, let them take up their cross and follow me. Now we hear this terminology all the time, but you have to understand when Jesus was speaking, the reality of the cross was, was something else for those people. I mean, the Romans were crucifying people left and right, Christians and Jews and who knows who else, you know. Um, the people, uh, uh, crucifixions were a, a part of regular life and they were horrible and they were gruesome. And so when Jesus says you're to take up your cross, he's not talking about, well, you know, there might be a couple challenges in your life. He's talking about this is life and death stuff, right? And, and I, I understand as Christians, we want the cross. I want the cross. We love the cross. We, we love the cross as long as Jesus is the only one hanging on it. Right? But the cross is not quite the same thing when it's you hanging on it. Or, you know, and I've said it before, and sometimes it causes a gasp, but we need to ask our question, ourselves a question from time to time. You know, do you look good on wood? Because I tell you, if you hang around the church long enough and you, you grow in your faith and you start taking positions of leadership and, and nurturing other people in their faith, you better believe you're going to get the attention of the devil. And you're going to have all kinds of opportunities to take up your cross for Jesus. But... The reality is, is that in many ways we've coddled ourselves and, and new believers with low expectations and cheap grace. And I understand why we do that at the beginning. You know, if somebody just comes and says, I want to be a follower of Jesus and you want to baptize him and you say, oh, that's great, but wait till you see what the devil's got in store for you, you know? I mean, that's not a marketing tool. You know, we, we talk to people about the benefits of faith, and there are so many benefits. Eternal life is no small benefit, you know, but at the same time, at some point, 
we have to nurture these new believers beyond the place of, you know, cheap grace and low expectations to help them to understand that they as Christians will one day be challenged to take up their cross for the glory of God. And if we don't do that, we do them a disservice. It's just a, it's a matter of trying to figure out when to do that before they fall by the wayside. So, certainly one reason why people backslide is that there are just some people who lack spiritual maturity. They don't have deep enough roots and, and we've got to be better at helping people to establish their, those roots and to challenge them and to nurture them. Uh, another cause of backsliding, and I see this uh, quite often, is just simply getting our priorities flipped. Right? And you see this too. You know, increasingly people resort to excuses for why they cannot be more faithful. Um, you can quote me on this. The road to backsliding is paved with excuses. Really good excuses sometimes. Right? Really clever excuses. There's no shortage of excuses for why we should just step back from the church or why we're not going to do this. And several years ago, I received one of those emails, you know, that comes through the internet, you know, and, and it's a, an illustration. And many of you have sent me uh, some of these thinking, you know, they might actually show up in a sermon someday. And, and oftentimes they do. Um, and I always appreciate that. But this is one of those things that came my way. And I was talking about um, backsliding in, term of, uh, in the term of people coming to worship on a regular basis. So people who were once very faithful in their worship attendance, now they rarely come at all. And so um, the title of this was No Excuse Sunday. Right? Maybe you've seen this. So what happens is, is that this church is going to have a no excuse Sunday. So the week before they send out a letter to the members of the church to explain what the no excuse Sunday is. And this is what it says. To make it possible for everyone to attend church this Sunday, we are going to have a special no excuse Sunday. That means that cots will be placed in the foyer for those who say, Sunday is my only day to sleep in. <laughs> and then we will have a, a section with lounge chairs for those who feel the pews are too hard. And, and we'll have eye drops and no dos and coffee and Tylenol. That'll be available for all those who are exhausted from staying out too late on Saturday night. Also note that blankets will be furnished for those who think the church is too cold and we will have fans for those who say the church is too hot. Of course there will be scorecards that will be available for those who wish to list all the hypocrites that are around them. And relatives and friends will be in attendance for those who like to spend their Sundays visiting. We will distribute, and many of you will appreciate this, we will distribute stamp out stewardship buttons for those who feel the church is always asking for money. And one section of the sanctuary will be devoted to trees and grass for those who like to seek God in nature. Doctors and nurses will be in attendance for those who plan to be sick that day. And we will, we will be providing hearing aids for those who can't hear the preacher. And we will be providing cotton balls for those who think the organ is too loud. <laughs> And um, then it kind of goes with a little more, and it says, hope to see you there. But I think you get the point. Now, I, I realize that joke may actually be a, a little bit of, of, of offensive to some of you, but I think it does make the point that there will always be an excuse, always an excuse to justify our lack of faithfulness to God. We can rationalize and justify anything. Um, 
But these are the words that Jesus asks of his followers. Commitment. Devotion. Self-sacrifice. Faithfulness. And, and those words, commitment, devotion, self-sacrifice, and faithfulness, those were words that were not found in those who turned back from Jesus that day and quit following him. But there were a few who remained, probably less than half of them, a few who remained, and they were committed, they were devoted, they were willing to make sacrifices, they were faithful. And Peter spoke for them when Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe, we have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Thank you, Peter. So I'm going to close my sermon with a story, just to help drive home um, the point, because I really like to drive home the point. True story goes back a long time. In fact, it goes back to uh, 1924, um, and um, it, it has to do with the Olympic Games that were in Paris in 1924. And you know how in the Olympics, they, they sometimes they add events um, to see if there's some interest in them. Like, you know, years ago, they added snowboarding to the Winter Olympics, and then it kind of caught on, and now it's a big-time event, that sort of thing. And so um, this was going on back in 1924, and they, they had added an event in, in the Olympics, um, and, and it was canoe racing. And they had two-man canoe teams and four-man canoe teams and all that. And uh, the team that was the favorite to win the gold medal at the 24 Olympics was the team from the United States of America. They had a very strong team. One member of that team was a young man named Bill Havens. Now, as the time for the Olympics neared, it became clear that Bill's wife was about to give birth to their first child. And um, he would, she would be giving birth about the time he was supposed to be competing in the Paris Olympic Games. Now you have to understand, in 1924, there weren't all these jet airliners to shoot you across the ocean. You know, most people were traveling by steamer or, you know, the slow boat, you know, type things. And, and so, you know, just to jump on a plane wasn't an option. So Bill Havens found himself with a, a little bit of a dilemma. Should he go to Paris or should he remain behind, stay with his wife so he could be there when they had the birth of their first child? Um, now Bill's wife, of course, she's a real trooper, she said, go to the Olympics, Bill, you know, that's, this is your dream, you've worked for it so hard all your life. And, but clearly the decision was not an easy one for Bill to make. Well, finally, after much soul searching, Bill Havens decided that he would withdraw from the competition. He would remain behind with his wife so that he could be with her when their first child was born. And remember, back in 1924, the childbirth was a much more risky thing even than it is now. So um, basically what Bill Havens decided to do was he decided that being with his wife at the birth of their child was simply a higher priority to him than going to Paris to fulfill his lifelong dream. See, we all got to set our priorities. We all got to, what's, what's the most important thing that we need to do? And usually when we set priorities, that means we may have to make some sacrifices. And sometimes those sacrifices are greater than at other times. Well, to make a long story shorter, um, the United States four-man uh, canoe team won the gold medal at the 1924 Paris Olympics. Um, Bill stayed behind. His wife was late in giving birth to their child. In fact, she went so late that he could have gone, competed in the Olympics, got on a steamer, returned to the United States, and had time to spare before the child was born. 
And so a lot of people said, you know, what a shame. What a shame. But Bill Havens said that he had no regrets. After all, he said his commitment, his devotion to his wife was more important than winning a gold medal. Was it a high price to pay? You better believe it. Did he have to make a sacrifice to do that? You bet. But it was not too high a price, not too high a sacrifice for him to make for someone he loved and someone who loved him. Who loves you more than anything else in the world? Who loves you? You know who it is. It's the, I always ask the preschool kids a question, you know, and the answer always is Jesus. That's always the safest answer. They answer Jesus to everything. <laughs> no one loves you more than Jesus. No one should be a higher priority in your life than Jesus. I hear that same kind of love in Peter's words when he says, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Those are words of commitment. Those are words of devotion. Those are words of sacrifice. Those are words of faithfulness. Now, of course, there is a sequel to the story of Bill Havens. The child eventually born to Bill Havens and his wife was a boy they named him Frank. 28 years later, in 1952, Bill Havens received a cablegram from his son Frank. It was sent from Helsinki, Finland, where the 1952 Olympics were being held. And the cablegram read, and I quote it exactly, Dad, I won. I'm bringing home the gold medal you lost while waiting for me to be born. And if you believe it, Frank Havens won the gold medal for the United States in the canoe racing event. He won the medal his father had dreamed of winning, but never did. But I ask you, where did this boy Frank learn such love and faithfulness to his family? He learned it from his father, who gave his chance of Olympic gold up for a woman he loved and a boy that was not yet even born. Commitment, devotion, sacrifice. That's what we do for those who love us and those we love. Jesus asked his disciples, you do not want to leave too, do you? Can you hear the anguish in his voice as all these people scatter into the wind in all the different directions? And he looks out at the few who remain and he says to them, you don't want to leave too, do you? And Simon Peter answered for him, and I pray he answers for all of us, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You are the Holy One of God. To whom shall you go? Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep our hearts and our minds one with and completely devoted to Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. At that, I invite you to stand as you are able. Uh, we'll sing our hymn of the day. Oh Jesus, I have promised. It's number 503.
Let us now affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed as printed on page 7 in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Let's take just a few minutes now to share the Lord's love and His peace with one another. Trusting in our loving Almighty God who abundantly provides the bread of life to all who hunger, let us pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. O merciful God, our journey of faith is often fraught with many distractions and challenges. The enemy of our faith is determined to sidetrack us and even derail us in our discipleship, in our commitment to answering Jesus' call that we take up our cross and follow him. Help us, Lord, to remain focused on your will and reinforce our desire to be faithful through obedience to your word so that we will accomplish your will and your purpose in this world. Surround us with your Holy Spirit, O Lord. Give us all wisdom and strength to keep us growing in our faith and in our faithfulness for God's glory. Hear us, O God. Almighty God, all of nature's power is in your hands. So once again, we pray for those in harm's way due to wildfires and hurricanes and other natural disasters. We ask you to protect all lives and property, to give supernatural strength and endurance to firefighters and first responders, to give those who are safe and who have much to share, uh, Call them and bring them to a place where they will bless those who are in the path of destruction with the help that they need to protect and rebuild their lives. Hear us, O oh God. Yes. And Holy Lord, on this day we lift up in prayer Art Harker and Cam Smith, asking for your continued healing of them. We lift up in our prayers Cindy McCain and the family and friends in a grateful nation who grieve the death of Senator John McCain. And we ask you to extend your comfort and peace to all others who we now name in the silence of our heart. Hear us, O God. Almighty and loving God, uh, we look to you in hope and trust, knowing that you will do far more than we ask or imagine through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. So we pray that prayer our Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Receive the Lord's blessing. May the God whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ever ask or imagine, may he grant you the gifts of faith and hope. And may Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.